Welcome to this honors physics lecture. Today it is on moment of inertia. We'll begin by reviewing inertia, which is relevant to Newton's first law. Inertia is an object's resistance to a change in motion. And by change in motion, what we are referring to is acceleration. So inertia is anything that resists acceleration. So in a rotational sense, rotational inertia is an object's resistance to a change in angular motion. Again, meaning angular acceleration, which is symbolized by the Greek letter alpha. Let's take an example of a meter stick. I'm gonna pivot this meter stick about its center of mass by grabbing it and shaking it back and forth in my hand by just twisting my wrist. Before I do that though, I'm gonna add some masses close to the center. When I begin the rotation, I should find that it moves fairly easily and not very difficult for me. If I reset this and move the masses further out to the end, and again try and rotate it about its center, what I will find is it will become much more difficult to do. In fact, it will feel heavier to me, even though it has exactly the same amount of mass. Let's address this mathematically with a simplified model. Rather than a meter stick, I'm going to begin with a thin rod of negligible mass, meaning I can ignore whatever mass it has. To the end of that, I'm going to attach two small masses. I will then take this system and set it rotating. This should require a certain amount of effort. But when I expand those masses out to a further point, it should take an increased amount of effort. This is because it has a higher moment of inertia. In looking at this system, we'll say each mass has mass m and is some distance r from the pivot point. Moment of inertia is defined as the sum of each mass element times that distance from the pivot squared. So in this example, it has moment of inertia equal to mr squared plus mr squared because I have two masses each out at distance r, giving me a total moment of inertia of 2 mr squared. There are a variety of different shaped objects. These are some of the standard ones, a ring, a sphere, a disc, a hollow sphere, and a rod. You do not have to memorize those. They are available to be looked up in your book on table 8.1. If you have a physical copy, I believe they are located on page 243. When you are working out a problem, if it states the shape of the object, a wheel, solid sphere, disc, it is assumed that you can look up what the moment of inertia is, or you'll just have to calculate a number for it in the problem. These shapes are all rotated about their center of mass. What do we do when we have an object that is rotated about a point not through its center of mass? That requires us to use the parallel axis theorem. Let's begin with an example of the thin rod. Here the rod is of length L, and I am going to rotate it through its center of mass. According to the previous table in 8.1, I can look up that the moment of inertia for a thin rod rotated through its center of mass is 1 12th ml squared. Now, let's move that point of rotation, some amount h, to the end of the rod. To calculate the moment of inertia, I will use the parallel axis theorem which says I take the moment of inertia about its center of mass plus the object's mass times the distance I've moved the pivot squared. So in this scenario, it has moment of inertia of 1 12th ml squared through its center of mass, and I have moved it some amount h. That h is equal to half the length because I moved it from its center to the end so instead of h, I will substitute l over 2. Squaring the l over 2, I get 1 12th ml squared plus 1 4th ml squared, which reduces 
to one third ml squared. This is the moment of inertia for a thin rod rotated about its end. All of this was because I applied the parallel axis theorem, which is defined here.